Good morning. Um, I am trying to figure out how to make my picture show bigger. I don't know if it's showing bigger on yours or not. Um, my name is Debbie Evans, and I am a, an enrolled agent, which is a federally licensed uh, tax professional. And I'm going to share my screen right now. And this morning, we are going to be talking about rental properties and the taxes that are associated with those. All right. So, um, and I work with many uh, clients who own uh, rental properties. Some of them are pretty professional about it, been doing it for a long time. Most of them don't really know that much about what they're doing. And so um, I thought this would be a good time to go through and just cover some of the information about it. Uh, I had one new client this last year who um, was giving me his information about his job and everything else. And he says, oh, I have you know rental property, but I'm not going to claim it because I had a loss. So I said, well, you know, you still need to claim it if you, you know, even have a loss. Well, he was counting a loss because he was paying the mortgage. Okay. Um, and that is not how that works. So uh, that the, we want to talk about that first. So when you own rental property and you receive rental income, that income is taxable income. And this is from the IRS tax law. Cash or the fair market value of property or services you receive for the use of real estate or personal property is taxable to you as rental income. Um, in general, you can't deduct expenses of renting property from your rental income. Okay, so uh, it's just like a business. It's just like having a business. You have income, you have revenue from the rental property, you have expenses um, for you receiving that income. Um, you have, <clears throat> you do, you might be paying a mortgage, but you might not be paying a mortgage. A lot of people um, own their properties outright. So mortgage, your your the money you pay for the mortgage is not a deductible expense. Okay. So let's be very, very clear about that. The money you pay for the mortgage is not a deductible expense. The interest you pay on the mortgage is a deductible expense. Okay. So if you're keeping a bookkeeping for your for your rentals, uh, if you're keeping, you know, an accounting record of it, then yeah, as far as cash flow goes, the money you pay for the mortgage is an expense from your cash flow. All right. But it's not an expense as far as taxes are concerned. Okay. So rental income, less deductible expenses equals a taxable profit or a loss, just like a business. Now, if it's a loss, the loss may or may not be deductible. We'll be talking more about that as we go through this. Now, if you have a taxable profit, let's say um, you receive income from your rentals, you pay out your expenses, you take all the deductions, and you still have a profit. That profit flows through to your personal 1040 tax return, and it is taxed at ordinary income tax rates. The advantage of profit from a rental income over a business is that it is not subject to the self-employment tax. It's not subject to payroll taxes. So money you earn from a job, you're paying tax and you're also paying social security and Medicare taxes. If you are self-employed, you're paying tax on your income, plus you're also paying self-employment taxes, which is your payroll taxes. Money you earn from your rental properties, from your investments, does not have that uh, self-employment payroll tax attached to it. So even if you make a profit from your from your properties, which is great, more money you know in your bank, um, you are still saving taxes on that because you're not subject to the payroll tax. Okay, now your rental property will be reported on Schedule E. This is on your regular 1040 tax return. OK, so this is a form that goes on your 1040 tax return. So this is an example of what that looks like. This is a close up of it. So these are some of the deductions that you can take. Um, advertising. Um, what are you paying to let people know you have property available? Maybe you're pay putting signs up. Maybe you put an ad on Facebook. Maybe you um, if you have an Airbnb or, or a beach house, um, you may be paying for some advertising for that. Auto and travel, we talk a lot about that as we go. Cleaning and maintenance. Um, if you have short-term rentals, 
and we're going to go into more detail about all this, but if you have short-term rentals, you're cleaning in between people coming. Um, that is deductible. Commissions, maybe you're paying a uh, real estate agent to get people into your property. Um, that's where that would go. Insurance, you, if as an as a owner of the property, you have insurance on your property. Um, that is fully deductible. Legal and professional fees. Um, professional fees would include an accountant. Um, this, if you if you purchase the webinar today, that's a tax deductible expense. You can write that off of your uh, professional fees there. Management fees um, would be um, obviously a management company that's just doing the um, property management for you. There's the mortgage interest. Um, if you have a mortgage, you're going to get a 1098 form at the end of the year that shows the interest that you paid on that mortgage. That is deductible here. Other interest, repairs, supplies, taxes, util property taxes would go there. Utilities, um, if the home is vacant for a little bit, you might be paying the utilities. That's deductible. Depreciation, we're going to talk a lot about depreciation because that is a huge one. So again, income, less expenses, less deductions is the amount that's going to go um, right here on line 24 or 25, that's going to flow through to your personal tax return. We're going to talk about if it's a loss, what that means. Okay, so here are some of the common ones that you um, that you can deduct. We talked about some of these already. HOA fees. Um, if you're if the rental property is in a um, a neighborhood with HOA fees, that's deductible. Uh, landscaping. If you're paying to keep the the yard nice, um, that is deductible. All of this is deductible. So. Home office expenses and business meals, we'll talk more about that. Uh, business meals really doesn't, doesn't come in this very often, but we can talk about that a little bit. Um, okay, so entity basics. So when you own a rental property, most people just own it personally, uh, and then they, they, they claim the income on the personal tax return, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, another option, though, would be to put your entity, or put your home, the property into an LLC. Now an LLC provides some legal protection. Now LLCs are tricky. Um, if you have a very committed lawyer who wants to sue you, there's probably ways around the LLC. So be very careful with how you, you handle your LLC. But the bottom line is, the LLC is, is an umbrella over the property that protects it. If somebody does sue you um, for the property, let's say somebody um, you're renting to um, slips and falls and, and you know falls off the roof or something and they wanna sue you for it. If they're suing within an LLC, they can only get what's in the LLC. If the property is individually owned by you, they potentially could go after your personal assets as well. So you have more at risk, all right? Now, I also recommend a really good insurance policy to protect you as well. Um, but putting a rental, putting rental property in an LLC is a very common thing to do. Now, LLCs are a state entity. They are not the IRS. The IRS does not recognize LLCs. So this has nothing to do with the IRS. The IRS wants to see that rental property on a Schedule E, on your personal tax return. That's how it's going to be taxed. The LLC is a legal protection that is a state entity. Now, a single member LLC um, would be just tax like normal. It's an individual. Now, if you're a husband and wife, you have or you have you uh, own property with friends, you're going to have a multi-member LLC. The IRS is going to look at that as a partnership. So, partnership tax return is different. Now, if you notice on the right of the screen, um, you should never put rental estate in an S or a C corporation. Now, I've actually seen some tax um, people recommending Schedule C's for uh, our S corporations for um, rental property. Here's why that is a bad idea. If you make a profit from your rental property, what happens if it's an S corporation? You are now liable for payroll taxes. So if you put your rental property in a corporation, an S or C corporation, and you do make a profit, you are now liable for an additional 15.3% in taxes. So we want to avoid taxes as much as we possibly can. So I recommend 
putting the property into an LLC. Okay. Um, now travel expenses. Let's say you buy some property. I'm in Texas. Let's say you buy some property in Hawaii. Now you have to go see your property every now and then, right? You might have a management company who's managing on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, you need to go check it at least once a year. So you want to go to Hawaii at least once a year to check on your property. Is this deductible? Yes, it is. It is deductible because you are going to visit your property. Now, the IRS knows that if you're in Hawaii, <laughs> You're probably going to hang out the beaches and have some personal time as well. So they will expect you to separate your personal from your business. So let's say you um, you you fly to Florida um, or fly to Hawaii. That airfare for you is 100 percent deductible. Let's say you take your wife and kids. Their airfare would not be deductible. Just yours. OK, but you're going to pay for a really nice hotel while you're there and the kids and the wife are staying with you. Right. Um, that's 100 percent deductible. OK, now, um, while you're there, any personal expenses you have would obviously not be deductible. So you can kind of split it up where you can have a little family vacation and you can still deduct quite a bit of it because you have to go check on your property. OK, now let's say you have a home. Um, um, I mean, I'm in Houston, Texas, to be specific. And let's say I have a beach house in Galveston and I drive down to Galveston once a month to check on it. That mileage for driving to Galveston and back is deductible. All right. I think the current rate is 58 cents a mile. So you would be able to um, to deduct that. Now, the trick with mileage and travel expenses and with every expense for that matter, is you have to document it very, very, very carefully. So make sure you're keeping a, a, a mileage log. If you do go to Hawaii to visit your property, make sure that you are tracking every penny you spend there and separating it from personal to business. Um, if you are audited, um, the IRS is going to want to see all this documentation or they will take all those expenses away from you and, and your taxable income will go up quite a bit. Okay, uh, at the end of this presentation, there's going to be a link for you to download these slides. All right, so you will be able to download the slides. Okay, um, let's see. Um, I'm not going to talk more about this now. Now here's the, the, here at the bottom, the mileage log. This is what the IRS wants to see. Um, the odometer at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. So a lot of people um, plan to have their oil changed at the first of the year. You know, first thing in January, get your oil changed. That way you have documentation of what the mileage was at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. Um, on your log should have the date of the trip, the purpose of the trip, the total miles of the trip and where you went exactly. So similar to business, the business mileage logs are, are the same, all right? Okay, um, let's see. Actual expense methods, this is a little bit more that I wanna go into for this particular um, webinar, but you have a choice of taking straight mileage or taking actual expenses. Even if you take actual expenses as a deduction for your vehicle, you still have to have the mileage log. Cause look right over here, um, business miles, total miles, all right? And you get the percentage and the percentage is what your actual expenses are based on. All right, so you have to keep the mileage log no matter what. Okay, traveling to new markets is a little bit different. Let's say you don't have a property in Hawaii yet, but you would like one. Um, and you get a, you travel to Hawaii a couple times to look at houses and see what you want to purchase. Um, this is a little bit different. This is the travel expenses there are not written off as a straight deduction. Now, when you deduct things for, 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 um, for a business or for a rental, um, you have two options for deductions. One is an immediate expense. I'm writing it off this year's tax return. I paid for it. You know, I'm writing it off. And the other is depreciation. And this is for something that's going to last longer. OK, so if you um, let's say for for um, your business, let's say you own a business and you buy a computer. A computer is expected to last longer than a year. So you, they want you to depreciate it, or you can take what's called a section 179 deduction. Um, if you buy printer ink, that's a consumable, so that's an immediate expense, all right? Um, can you deduct a computer and um, printer ink for your rental property? 
Yeah. Now, if you only have one rental property, um, some of these are a little bit um, sketchier, but some people have multiple properties. And in that case, you're more likely to need a home office, um, a, print, a computer for the, for the rentals. Now, let's say you have a computer that you're using for personal and work or your rentals. You would divide that as a percentage from personal expense versus business expense. So you can have that, you can have that, but you just divide up the expenses. Okay. So what types of travel expenses are deductible? We talked a little bit about this. Now, while you are traveling, you can deduct your meals. Okay. Now, if you are driving to the beach to visit your beach house, um, I would not deduct those meals. But if you're traveling, absolutely. Okay, mixing personal business. We talked about this one already. You can go back and review the slide later. Now, the date placed in service. This is very important. So let's say we have a new property. You just you bought a property this year, and it needs some fixing up before you can put it available for for rent. Okay, um, that happens a lot, right? You buy a cheap property, you you fix it up some, and then you put it make it available for rent. Um, the date placed in service is a very important date. That is the date it is available for a renter. It's open for business. That doesn't mean there's a renter in there. It means it's available. Okay, so if you have a rental property that you just purchased and you're going to gut the kitchen and you're going to do, you know, nobody can live in it. Right. Um, but let's say you just need to do some more repair work and you're going to maybe paint or you're going to you know, do some things. Um, theoretically, somebody could be living there while you do that. OK, so, so keep the, those differences in mind. So the date is placed in service is the date you can start taking deductions. OK, um, if you once you if you buy the property and it's not available for rent yet, it's not available to produce income, you can't deduct those expenses right off. They need to be added to the value of the home for depreciation. OK, so. Here's some examples of things you might be doing before you place a property in service things like this. But after the properties and service, you could do some of these kinds of things right here, okay? Now, the difference is how you can expense it. Now, like I said, you can have the property available for a renter, but maybe somebody calls and they say, um, well, you know, I don't really want to be living there while you're painting and doing this stuff. I'd rather live in a house that's, you know, done. Um, that's fine. Um, you, it's available for rent, it's available to produce income, whether somebody chooses to live there or not. You can start deducting those expenses right off the bat. Okay, now capital improvements versus repairs and maintenance. This is very important. Um, any repairs that you make to the home include things that don't improve the value of the home. They're basically getting it back to like it should be. Okay, so let's say, um, there's a broken window. If you replace the window with just the same kind of window that's on all the other windows, that's a repair. That's an immediate expense. If you replace all the windows with climate controlled double pane glass, that is an improvement. Okay, so that is different. So improvements are capitalized, improvements are depreciated. Uh, we're going to talk more about depreciation. We're going to get there. Um, and the reason this is important because depreciation is huge. It's a huge way to get a tax deduction without cutting into your cash flow. But when you sell the property, you have to recapture depreciation. So you need to be a little bit strategic about some of the ways that you do some of these repairs and some of these classifications. Okay. Um, so examples of capital improvements versus repairs and maintenance. You can go back and look at this later. We talked about this already. Now, depreciation. This is huge. Depreciation is one of the biggest and most important deductions for real estate investors because it reduces the taxable income but not the cash flow. So, for example, let's say you buy a property for $150,000. 
Okay. The IRS wants you to depreciate this over 27 and a half years. So that is the established date for depreciation of residential rental property. And residential is different than commercial. We're talking about residential today. Okay. 27.5 years. So that means it's 54, 55 that you can deduct every year. So you're not spending the 54, 55 each year out of your cash flow, but you're getting that deduction. So this is where the mortgage comes in. If you buy property for cash, you have no mortgage, right? So there's no, there's no deduction for interest, but you still get the $54.55 per year. Now, this is, again, based on a $150,000 basis. Um, if you have a mortgage and you're paying um, the, 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 um, the mortgage fee each month, then that is not considered in any of this. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now, depreciation means that the value of the home will decline as the years pass. Now, here's the difference in depreciation and appreciation. That's not necessarily true, right? Um, real estate appreciates in value. So your goal in real estate is that you have this, this asset that's valuable, and one day you can sell it for more than you paid for it, right? So that's appreciation. So depreciation is um, kind of a special tax thing that, that's really good to have. Um, now, land does not depreciate. So when you figure out the amount for depreciation, you need to take out the land cost. Now, a lot of property tax reports will already have this separated. They'll tell you the property tax value and then they will have land listed separately. If you don't have that, 20% to land, 80% to the building is a common uh, practice. Um, so 80% of what you're, you're paying for it will be depreciated. Okay. Um, now, why is this important? This is important because you're getting that extra boom for uh, your tax deduction. So this is deducted off of, in addition to any other expenses that you have, okay? Um, now, cost segregation studies. This is a practice that's becoming more popular the last few years. I think more people are kind of figuring out about it. Uh, so cost segregation and 100% bonus depreciation. Now, what this means is that the home is scheduled to depreciate over 27 and a half years. Now you have the choice of just saying, okay, I bought this property for this much, this is the depreciation for it. Or you can go through and do a cost segregation study, which you have to pay somebody to do this. This is a service that has a professionals do for you. Um, you can't just make it up and, and expect the IRS to go along with you. Um, you can try, but. <laughs> um, so cost segregation means you're taking the different parts of that home and you're separating them out and you're giving them different um, time values for depreciation. For example, um, $150,000 basis. Um, but I'm going to take the AC system and look at that separately. It's a newer system, uh, values $5,000. We can depreciate that over 15 years. So you're gonna subtract the 5,000 from the 150 and you're gonna put it separately. So it's depreciating a little bit faster um, at a faster rate. Um, maybe you have, uh, you can separate the roof out. Maybe you can separate out the appliances. So the idea is to take parts of that home and depreciate them faster than the 27.5 years. Also, you might be eligible for 100, excuse me, 100% bonus depreciation, which is right here. Um, bonus depreciation changes every few years with the tax laws. Um, there are tax laws that are in place and pretty much accepted and have been around for a long time and they'll be around for a long time. Um, other things kind of come and go depending on what is happening with the economy. Um, tax law is very manipulative. Uh, a lot of the tax law is in place because government wants us to do certain things. We have advantages in real estate investing because the IRS wants us to do that or government Congress wants us to do that. Um, you get benefits for um, being self-employed because that's what Congress wants because small businesses are a big driver of employment. Um, they hire a lot of people. 
And so uh, the 100% depreciation is a way to um, get people to buy more stuff <laughs> and you can write it off faster. So uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that was the Trump law that came through in 2017. Five years, seven year and 15 year property is eligible for 100% bonus depreciation. That means that you can write off the whole thing in the first year that you pay for it. So it's more like an expense. So if you go and you buy all new appliances for a rental house, um, you can probably deduct the whole thing at once. And I'll talk about why you may or may not want to do that. Um, the advantage is um, because of getting that tax break, right? Okay, so this is an example of that. Um, so if you have a building with a value of $100,000, that's $3,000. $1,636 in annual depreciation. But you do a cost segregation study, find that 20% of the value um, can be uh, reclassified and you can deduct $20,000 in 100% bonus depreciation. And then the 2909 is the annual that goes from there. So 20,000 just right off the top. Okay, so passive activity limits and passive losses. All right, so you have, we're going to assume that your rental is losing money because that's the whole purpose of having rental property is you want to, on paper, lose money so that you are not paying taxes on it. Okay, so um, now remember, we're not losing money because we're paying a mortgage. Okay, this is, this is on paper tax money, tax dollars, um, paper money. So if the paperwork shows that you have a loss, you may be able to subtract that amount from your regular income. Remember, this is reported on your personal tax return and the profit or loss flows to page one of your personal tax return. So let's say you have a W-2 for $75,000 and you have a $5,000 loss on your rental property um, that means you, your taxable income is now $70,000 instead of 75. Okay. So now real estate is considered a passive income. Um, and that's only has to do with, with how it's taxed. So passive losses can only count against other passive losses. But if you make under a hundred thousand dollars, you can deduct up to $25,000 in losses. You can take $25,000 in losses against your personal income. So that income cap is important. Now, if you uh, do have a paper loss, you still own the property, you still have the valuable asset, you still have the cash flow from the rent coming in. Now, if you have a mortgage, you have less cash flow, um, you still have the property, right? And so basically the renters are paying for you to own the property. So it's a free house basically, right? Um, so even if you don't see cash flow profits coming through, um, owning rental property is still putting cash in your pocket, okay? Now, if you make more than $100,000 a year and you are unable to take that loss, um, because you're over the income bracket, the losses will carry forward. So you still want to report them in your tax return. You still want to, to show the loss and then it will carry forward each year. So when you sell the property, all of those losses that you were not able to take, you can now take and reduce any tax that you would owe on selling the property. OK, um, so they carried forward indefinitely until you either have a passive income or you sell property to gain. Now, passive income includes your stocks. So um, if you lose money in the stock market, you lose money and uh, probably losing money in the stock market is you can't take the loss at all. Um, but you can count. Let's say you have a gain. Let's say you have a good year with the stocks and you have some you make you make some money and then you have a loss from your rental property. Um, the loss can go against the stocks. So it's, 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 it's I look at like monopolies, all paper money, really dealing with tax returns. Um, and this is why you need a professional to really help you with some of this stuff. But um, basically, um, at worst, you're zeroing it out. 
And so you are, have the money coming in from the rentals, but you are not paying taxes on it. Okay, so this is what we just talked about, the passive activity limits. $25,000 um, of loss can be um, applied against your ordinary income um, if you're below that overall um, uh, income bracket. Okay, it starts phasing out over $100,000. Now, real estate professional status. This is something the IRS came up with that says, if you are a real estate professional, then you can take much bigger losses. So you can have, um, even if you're over the $100,000, you can still um, take all the losses um, if you're a real estate professional. So a lot of people say, oh, I want a real estate, I want, I want a rent house, I'm a real estate professional. Um, no, because these are the rules to be a real estate professional. You must spend at least 750 hours in a real estate trader business. More than half your total working hours must be in a real estate trader business. So if you own one property and you have a full-time job, there's absolutely no way this is going to happen. But on the other hand, you don't need it to because you still have, you know, you can still have the loss of up to twenty five thousand um, dollars. Now, if you are if you own multiple properties and let's say one spouse um, works and one spouse stays home, um, the spouse staying home could qualify to be a real estate professional um, as long as you're following all these guidelines. Now the IRS is real sticky about this. So if this is something you want to do, make sure that it is, um, that you meet all of the qualifications for it. Okay, um, let's see, capital gains, tax and depreciation recapture. Okay, now here is where um, the, uh, the, the rental investment tax benefits kind of come back and bite check. And that is when you go to sell the property. Now, when you go to sell the property, you, you are um, subject to two taxes. One is the capital gains tax. Now, let's say you bought your property for $150,000. You sell it for $200,000. You have a gain of $50,000, right? That's how much money you made on the property. Now, that is taxed at capital gains rates, which is probably an average of 20%. Okay, so 20% of that $50,000 you're paying tax on. Okay, Are your, your, that's the tax you're paying. Now, you also have to recapture any depreciation that you took. So if you know that you are buying a house to flip it in a couple of years, you might not want to have taken some of those bonus depreciation and extra extra money up front um, because you got to take it back now and it's taxed at ordinary rates. So you have a $50,000 gain for capital gains and then you also have a depreciation recapture of say $10,000. Um, that $10,000 is subject to ordinary income tax, whatever your tax rate is, which could be up to 37%. So it's just added to your other income for that. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, I'm not gonna take depreciation then. I'm just gonna give up that benefit. You can't do that because the IRS will assume you took it and they're going to take the recapture anyway. And so um, you will have just lost out twice in that case. So make sure you take your depreciation. And if you know you're gonna hold on to a home for a very long time, um, then, then yeah, take all the depreciation that you can. Now let's say you um, let's say you are going to hold on to the property until you die, and you're going to will it to your children. Okay. Now, basis is what you paid for the property. So if you um, let's say you had the hundred fifty thousand dollar basis, and the house is now worth three hundred thousand dollars, which is happening in the last couple of years. Um, it's it's crazy. Um, then the three hundred thousand dollars is going to be the difference, and that one hundred fifty thousand dollars is a difference in your gain. Okay. Now, if you give the property to your kids, that one hundred fifty thousand dollars is still the basis, and if they sell it, that's the basis they're going to have to use. So they're going to have a big tax. Um, from selling that property. But if you die and they inherit it, we have what's called a bump up basis, 
which means their basis is now the value of the home on the day that you died. So $300,000, that's their new basis. If they turn around and sell it right away for $300,000, they have no tax to deal with. Um, if they then sell it for $400,000, then they have a gain of $100,000, but that's better than the $150,000 basis that you started with. So when you are um, getting into rental investing or a business, I tell this to my business clients as well, what do you want to get out of it? Why are you doing this? If you say, I want to have, I want to have this investment, I want to have uh, money for my retirement, the home will be paid for by the time I retire and I'll just have that cash flow will be, you know, help pay my bills. And then I'm going to, you know, my kids can inherit it and do whatever they want with it. Then that is great. You could just, you just write it out. Um, but if you say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to flip, I'm going to buy houses. I'm going to flip them and sell them. Um, then there are different tax things that you might want to consider um, for those benefits. Okay. Um, for example, uh, if you have, um, they have a thing now where if you are in your primary home for at least two years out of five, the most recent five years, then you can exempt up to $500,000 for married filing joint from the, um, the, the, the gain. So if you are buying and flipping homes, some people just like that. They like going in there and just fixing up the house and they live in it. So if you live in the property for two years while you're fixing it up and then you rent it for two years and then in the fifth year you sell it, um, it is considered your primary home at that point and you can take that exemption. So that is, so if you're a flipper, that is something you want to consider. That would be really, that's going to save you a lot of taxes over if you are just um, flipping and not living in it. Okay. So, so depending on why you are rent, why you have rental property, why you're doing this, you might have different tax strategies that you want to use. Okay. Um, tax loss harvesting. This is, um, has to do with that capital gain again. Um, and if you have, let's say you, you have a gain of $10,000 on the, on the home and you have, so you say, well, um, I have some stocks that are doing pretty poorly. So I'm going to sell those off and take a loss. And that loss is applied against that gain for the home. So you can save some tax money that way. So again, that's strategic. Something you talk to your, your financial advisor about as far as how to time those things. Now, 1031 exchanges are very, very popular, but they're very tricky. And the law has um, tightened up a bit on those. It was that if you sold a property... You could buy any other property and basically the basis from the one would just go on to the next one. So you would just, you're deferring taxes, you're kicking that tax bucket down the road. And so um, uh, you can uh, just put off the taxes. They're added up. So eventually, you know, they're going to, they're going to, you're going to get hit with them. But um, a couple of years ago, they changed the law so that it can only be to a like property. So if you have a single home, a single family home and you sell it, you have to buy another single family home. If you have a commercial property, you have to buy another commercial property. And the other thing with 1031 exchanges is it's not something you can think of after the fact. You have to have somebody to help you with it. There are people who, uh, who do this, if this is their business. And what happens is you sell the property, you give the, the, income to this third party they hold it for you until you find the new property you want to purchase and then they give you the money back to pay for the for that purchase and that is the only way a 1031 exchange can be done so if you sell one property you buy another property um without doing a 1031 exchange without having that third party in there helping you do it you do not get the tax advantage Okay, so you have to, again, strategy, you have to plan ahead for this. Okay, all right. Um, let's see, installment sales, cost segregation, we talked about that. Um, installment sales is basically owner financing. So you are spreading out that income that you're getting. So if you sell a property, uh, traditionally, you just get this big chunk of money at once, right? And that's taxed at once. Now, well, not only are you taxed on that big chunk of money, but that big chunk of money is added to your regular income 
and could possibly bump you into another tax bracket. So have to be careful about that. An installment sale is an owner financing that allows you to take the payments, um, you know, on, over several years, and then you can spread out the gain over several years and reduce the taxes you pay each year. Okay, plus you get the interest on it, so you get extra money that way. Okay, uh, now we've been talking about long-term rentals. Short-term rentals are very, very popular right now. So a couple of different ways to look at short-term rentals. Um, if you have an Airbnb, um, if you have a beach house, um, if you have um, a bed and breakfast, these are all going to be treated a little bit differently than, um, than, than each other, but also differently, differently than the, um, the long-term rental. Okay, so let's say you have a beach house. And the beach house is one that you want to use personally, right? You want to be able to go, you're renting it out when you're not using it, but you want to be able to go to the beach with your family and enjoy having that home. Now, um, this splits the, the property from personal to business, okay? So you can still, you can still um, deduct the prorated business expenses you cannot take a loss. You can't come down below zero on it. Okay. Um, if you use if you use your home for less than fourteen days a year, and you rent it the whole rest of the time. Now, again, that doesn't mean that somebody's in there all the time. It means it's available to be rented, and you're only going there less than fourteen days um, for the year. Then any income that you make on the rental is, um, let, me, let me go backwards. I'm sorry, I got confused there for a second. Okay. Um, if you rent it out less than 14 days of the year, you don't owe any taxes on that income. You also cannot deduct any of the expenses. Okay, so free money. Um, and so a lot of this, this came about for, I think it was a Kentucky Derby um, that people were renting their homes for people coming to the Derby. Um, and so this actually went to, went to, went to tax court and they don't have to pay taxes on that income. And that income could be pretty high um, during that, that time, and but they don't have to pay any taxes on it. Now, so if you rent your home for 14 days or less, you do not owe taxes on it. If you rent out the home for more than 14 days, then it becomes a rental property, okay? Um, but if you are using the property for... Uh, more than those 14 days. So you're, you're using the property more than you might have to split the personal and the business income and the expenses. Okay, so for example, you have a three bedroom house and rent out one of the rooms. So it's like an Airbnb. If you rent the room for 95 days out of the year, it's rental usage is 26% because you only rented one third of your house for 26% of the year. You can only deduct 8.67% of the expenses related to the entire home. Okay, so we got to do some math there. Um, if these expenses related to your entire home total $15,000, you're deducting $1,300. Okay, any direct rental expenses, however, are 100% deductible. Okay, so 15 days or more, you rent the home for 15 days or more. Now it is a, it a rental property and you report that income on Schedule E of your tax returns. The expenses are only deductible to the extent of your income. So this is one that it is your primary residence or your personal vacation home that you're also renting, okay? Um, so the 14 days, 15 days is very important there. Okay, um, now, if you have a bed and breakfast, meaning you are showing up, you are making breakfast, you are providing more services, you are possibly running a business at that point and income would have to be claimed on Schedule C, um, and you would have to pay self-employment tax on that income, okay? Now, if it's an Airbnb and you don't provide any extra services, I said I stayed in an Airbnb a few months ago and, you know, I showed up, I, you know, stayed there, I left, and I didn't see the people at all. Um, that's just straight up rental, okay? So even though it's short term, all of the same rules we've been talking about apply. But I've also been to bed and breakfasts where they um, they come in and they 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 um, provide breakfast, they provide you know wine and fruit trays. When you get there, they're they're there visiting with us. Um, it's very personal. 
that rises to the level of um, a business where Schedule C and self-employment tax applies as opposed to the Schedule E. So providing light amenities like soap or towels or changing the sheets is not going to rise the level of substantial services. Okay, so you can do stuff for your renters uh, without it being this level. Okay, and you'll find that a lot of people, a lot of rent uh, people who um, provide rental property are trying to stay under that level there. Okay, now 20% pass through deduction. This is a tax um, cut. It's, it's, it's a new deduction that came through with the Trump laws. Um, it applies to businesses, but it also applies to real estate if you say, I am trying to make a profit. I am I'm making money off of my rental property. It is a business for me. Um, then you may qualify for this 20% deduction on your taxes. So it's really, really good. It's really huge. Now, again, it has a, an income threshold, and this is for business or for, um, for rentals. Okay, now, in order to do this, you need to be very careful about how you're keeping your records, which you should be doing anyway, okay? You need to track every single thing that you spend money on um, for your rental property to show that you are running it like a business. Okay, casualty losses. Let's say something happens to your house. Um, we're in Houston. We have a lot of flooding going on. I had several clients with rental properties that were flooded. Um, I had one where the, um, the tenant managed to set the, the condo on fire and burnt like four condos around it. Um, so these things happen. So number one, you want to have really, really good insurance, right? Okay. Now here's how it works with the, with the taxes and the property. If you receive a reimbursement from your insurance company for exactly the amount of your property's adjusted basis, there's no gain or loss. So we're talking about one that's gutted, right? It's it's, it's done. Um, if you get if your insurance money covers what you what the basis was, there's no gain or loss. If you get more money than your basis from the insurance company, that is a gain. Okay. Now you can reinvest the proceeds into a property. You have two years from the end of the tax period which the gain was received to find a suitable replacement. Okay, so in the case of a casualty loss and you say, well, I want to buy another property, you have two years to figure it out before you have to deal with any taxable gain. So that's a little bit of it. That's an added amount of time there for that one. Okay, now um, that means that if you spend a bunch of money to repair the home, um, say it's a flood and you, you, you fix it up, you're able to you know, get it back to normal and you spend a bunch of money, but then the insurance pays you back for it, then that is not a tax deduction. You can't deduct those expenses you spent because you get it paid back, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so that is my presentation for rentals. Um, this is the link to download the slides. So you can go back and review those. This is, you take a picture of this with your phone and or just hold your phone up to it and it will go directly to the same website as this. And that's where these slides are for you to look at it. Um, so I hope this was helpful. I do recommend um, have owning rental property as a, as a wonderful investment. It really, really is. Um, and so there's, there's so many benefits to it. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to, to message me and ask uh, if you would like to have some help with your rental property, um, getting the best tax benefits from it or um, any questions that you have, I'm, I'm, that's what I do. So that's, that's my business. So um, this is my, my information, evanstaxco.com is my website. Um, bestfinancialfriends.com is my membership website uh, where I have a lot of information available there. Um, so thank you very much for attending the webinar. I'm gonna stop the share right now. And I hope you have a really wonderful day. And bye-bye.